Hey there, welcome to the YouTube channel. I pray that this message encourages you and it helps you grow and become more like Jesus. And make sure you hit the subscribe button so you can continue to grow and learn more. Enjoy. Good morning. It's a beautiful weekend, isn't it? And it's been a beautiful weekend together as a church. And I'm just excited to share this, this final message of this series today. And just to help you catch up real quick in case you've missed some of them, we began our journey of our Together series talking about how we are the body of Christ, whether we are physically together or not, spiritually we are together. And so I challenge us as a church to make sure we get together physically to live out who we are spiritually and the importance of helping each other. The second week, I talked about caring each other's burdens and caring for one another and how the word care is a very simple but profound act of love for one another. And then the third week, I talked about helping each other grow, how we intentionally encourage and spur one another on towards growing in Christ and becoming more like Jesus. And I always love to end series with the outward focus, and that's what today is, because it's not just about us, church. It's not just about us Christians. Jesus came. He said this, I have come to seek and save the lost. He didn't say just the church, but all, and by the way, the church was lost, but then we were found. And so now it's time to help and be a part of the mission and going out together. And today, I pray that you find that we are strong and courageous together to go and reach the world. I have a dream that our groups, our fellowship that we have with a few, that we will intentionally get together, that we will be purposeful of surrounding ourselves with other believers that will help carry our burdens and we help carry theirs that we will help each other grow spiritually by praying and reading the word and hold each other accountable to obey in the word. But I also pray that we not forget the loss that's all around us, that we would leave space for people to be a part of our lives. And here's the reality, here's what's gonna happen, is you're not gonna have any room if we're on mission and going out and reaching the lost. You're not gonna have room in your house, you're not gonna have room in your fellowship, you're gonna have to do something that's difficult, it's called multiply. It means to, to grow in such a way that, that now I'm bringing someone into that circle and there's just not enough room at that table, so we better split up and, and do groups at different times with these new believers. And the dream would be is that you help someone, you invite someone who's lost or someone who's a new believer, help them believe in Christ, grow in Christ, and then they go do the same thing. And I'm not just making this up. This is what scripture meant when Jesus said in Matthew 28, go and make disciples, teaching them to obey everything. Well, that wasn't gonna stop with a handful of 12 people. It was gonna keep going and going and going. And today we are here because of that. Mark chapter 16, 15 through 18. Here's the scriptural background for going. Jesus said this, he, he already rose again. He's getting ready to go to the Father and he has some final words for the church and here's some of them today. Go into all the world and preach the good news to everyone. Anyone who believes and is baptized will be saved, but anyone who refuses to believe will be condemned. These miraculous signs will go with or accompany those who believe. You ready? This is gonna be a little interesting. Maybe you haven't read this in scripture. When those who believe, they will be able to cast out demons in my name. They will speak in new languages. They will be able to handle snakes with safety. And if they drink anything poisonous, it won't hurt them. Now, I'm not saying you should purposely go do that. Okay, there's been some weird churches that have popped up around the world where they, they handle snakes and try to drink poison, and it doesn't end well. But what we find out later and later in the book of Acts is Paul was was in a situation where he was picking up firewood and a snake reached out and bit him and he didn't die. And so that was God's will for him not to die in that moment. So I'm not saying go handle snakes or anything. Okay, church. They will be able, I mean, everyone who's scared of snakes are like, thanks, I appreciate that. 
they will be able to place their hands on the sick and they will be healed. Yes, believers in Jesus Christ can do these things. And then Acts 1, 4 through 8, Jesus tells his followers something really important. He says, do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised, as I told you before. John baptized with water, but just in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. The difference between water baptism is we go under the water and you're soaking wet when you come back up. That will be next week. The baptism of the Holy Spirit, there is no water. It's the Holy Spirit coming over you and soaking you in his presence. And Jesus is saying, wait for that baptism in Jerusalem to his devoted followers. So it says in verse 6, so when the, when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore our kingdom? He replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times, and they are not for you to know. So we have no idea when Jesus is going to fulfill all that's said in the word of God when he comes back. But this is what he wants, him, he wants his followers to focus on. He's like, look, don't worry about that. Right now, focus on this. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. So church, that was for then and that is still for today. Because the mission isn't over. Jesus hasn't come back. He's still sending out his people to go and change the world. And so this command to wait on God for the Holy Spirit to come upon us, to baptize the Holy Spirit, is something we should do as a church, individually in our homes, wherever it may be, to be better than everyone else spiritually? No. To have responsibility to be witnesses throughout the entire world. By the way, what a joy it is to be an Air Force church and sending people all over the world anointed by the Holy Spirit. It's so cool. We are a missional church accidentally, but we're intentionally sending out people as well as they go out to other countries. Well, let's see. Did Peter and John take this literal? Did they trust Jesus at his word? Well, yes. They were waiting in Jerusalem. They obeyed. They waited. The Holy Spirit fell upon them. And they prophesied and spoke in another language. And everyone who was around heard it in Jerusalem. And there was a, an outbreak of the Holy Spirit upon those few. But then it turned into the gospel being preached by Peter. And thousands of people gave their life to Christ. But he didn't stop there. I want to go to Acts chapter 3. This is why I asked you in the email this week uh, to bring your Bibles. Because we're going to read quite a bit of scripture today. Because I want you to see a story of two men and a church and how strong and courageous they were with the help of the Holy Spirit in the middle of going and doing and obeying the command they simply obeyed Jesus and this is what happens when you obey Acts chapter 3 verse 1 says this Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service as they approached the temple A man lame from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate, the one called the beautiful gate, so he could beg from the people going into the temple. Now this is pretty strategic of this man, if you think about it. Because what would they do? They would come to the temple and bring their offerings and alms. And some of them would drop their alms or their offerings to the poor or the needy on the way in. Was it always for the best motive? Not likely. This man was smart. He was an opportunist. He said, I'll stay right here. I'll get all the money I need. Well, let's see what happens next. Peter and John looked at him intently, and Peter said, look at us. The lame man looked at them eagerly, expecting some money, but Peter said, we're broke. I don't have any silver or gold for you, but I'll give you something better. What I have, what I have is Jesus Christ. 
He says, in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. He jumped up, stood on his feet, and began to walk. Then walking, leaping, and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Wow. Do you see that, what happened there? Do you see the shift in what took place? This is what motivates me to, as I go about doing life all day, as I go about getting groceries, as I go about getting a coffee or going shopping or going to a sports activity with the kids or going to my neighbor's house, do you see what happens that, that God puts it on someone's heart as they're going to prayer service? God gives them the eyes to see and hear this man and offer him a healing and that God wants to do that through you and I as you go about living. Praise God. Well, not me, Ryan. I, not, not me. I, I, I'm, I'm just an ordinary person. Well, let me keep reading here in a minute. Just hold on to that. But I want you to see what happens to this, this gentleman. For years, he wasn't inside the temple worshiping. He was begging for money. One moment of faith and the power of the Holy Spirit, and now he's, it says here, he's in the temple praising God, not needing money. That's why I go and I live life filled with the Holy Spirit and ready to pray for people and ready to share Jesus with them because it may be that one day they're in this pit in darkness and the next day they're right next to us in worship praising Jesus. They're right next to us in church praising God because my life has been changed. That's what sets me on fire to go share the gospel. Because I want someone to no longer depend on an earthly thing to help save them. Guess what, church? He found something greater than money. And his name is Jesus. He couldn't work. He couldn't make a living. So he was desperate for whatever he could get. But now he was restored spiritually. And now he's worshiping God, giving him praise. And now he's going to be able to work for a living and, and, and help other people now too, isn't he? Because his life was changed dramatically. Church, as you go about walking, God wants to use you. As you go to church, as you go to your friend's house, there will be someone that God will put on your heart or God will show you to pray for and to minister to. We just have to be willing to go. And for them, they were going to church. Well, let's keep reading because you would think this is, this is like really cool to all the spiritual priests and leaders of that day, right? This should be great. Nope. You see, the gospel is offensive to those who don't like Jesus at this time. The gospel was a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to the Romans or the Greeks, the Gentiles. Why? Because Jesus claimed to be God in human form and they would not accept that, but yet he kept doing things that God would do. It's a stumbling block. And to the Greeks and the Romans, it was foolishness because what leader dies to save them? Every leader made sure they stayed safe, made sure they... You know, didn't die. They had tons of people protecting them. But Jesus would die for us. It was foolishness. Wow. They didn't like it. So this is what they do next. Let's go to Acts chapter 4, verse 1. Peter, by the way, preaches the gospel when you get a chance, because the time is short. Acts chapter 3. 12 through 26. Do you want the gospel in a few verses? It's right there. He preaches the gospel. He preaches about resurrection, the resurrection of Christ. He has healed this man and he is not liked for it. It says this, while Peter and John were speaking, this is verse one of chapter four, to the people, they were confronted by the priest, the captain of the temple guard, and some of the Sadducees. 
These leaders were very disturbed that Peter and John were teaching the people that through Jesus there is a resurrection of the dead. The Pharisees believed that could happen. The Sadducees did not. They denied supernatural works. So the Sadducees specifically were really upset. So verse 3, they arrested them, and since it was already evening, put them in jail until morning. But many of the people who heard their message believed it. So the number of believers now totaled about 5,000 men, not counting women and children. The next day, the council of all the rulers and elders and teachers of religious law met in Jerusalem. Ananias, the high priest, was there, along with Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and demanded, by what power or in whose name have you done this? Do we, let's take a pause real quick. Do you see what's happening here? They throw them in prison for doing something that was totally legal to do. And by the way, it was really good what they were doing. It was what God asked them to do. So they're being thrown in prison for being obedient. So just beware that when you follow Jesus and you're obedient to God, it won't always go that great. And any preacher or church that teaches you that you shouldn't have any hardship, they're lying to you. That's the wrong gospel. It's not, it's not what Jesus warned us about. Every once in a while, I remind us of that so we won't be scared. But we expect it. But do you notice that they bring in a bunch of people so they can be intimidating? And they made sure they stayed over prison and overnight, wearing them down, and it's time to confront them, and they bring all the big shots in, and they start to question. And it didn't, it didn't even phase Peter. It says this, Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Church, the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, and you're going to speak in such a way that the Holy Spirit is speaking through you. It happens all the time. He says this, rulers and elders of our people, are we being questioned today because we've done a good deed for a crippled man? Do you want to know how he was healed? Let me clearly state to all of you and to all the people of Israel that he was healed by the powerful name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene. Notice he didn't take credit. The man you crucified, and then he gets really real here, the man you killed but whom God raised from the dead. It was that one. For Jesus is the one referred to in the scriptures where it says the stone that you builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. So God glorified his son and now he's holding everything together as a cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else. God has given no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. There is no other salvation church. There is no other name, no other God, only Jesus. Can we get an amen in this house? And that goes for us personally. When we put our faith in things or possessions, position or power, you're wasting your time. Only Jesus will get you through what we're going through in our world. Only Jesus will get you to eternal life and save you from your sin. Verse 13 says, The members of the council were amazed when they saw the boldness of Peter and John. You ready? Remember I told you? Well, I'm just an ordinary person. Oh, yeah? Well, guess what? It says here, For they could see that they were ordinary men. With no special training in the scriptures. But here's the, here's the key. But they also recognized them as men who had been with Jesus. All you need is Jesus. You don't need a doctor's degree to go change the world. You just need Jesus. If you're full of Jesus and you're full of his spirit, watch out. You're going to do some awesome things. But the thing is, is we got to hang out with Jesus because they did in Acts 2. They waited. We got to obey Jesus because they obeyed him and they, and they waited and they sought the face of God. They prayed. And when they did, the Holy Spirit, the gift of the Holy Spirit came uh, down on them and upon them. And they were filled with the Spirit 
and the whole book of Acts is Acts of the Spirit through the apostles and through his church, not just the apostles. It was the work of the community of believers and the Holy Spirit working. So what do you do when uh, you face people that bold and that strong and courageous? Well, you threaten them to be quiet. That's what happens next. But since they could see the man, verse 14, who had been healed standing right there among them, there was nothing the council could say. So they ordered Peter and John out of the council chamber and conferred among themselves. Church, I want to encourage you real quick. Do not count out your testimony is not powerful because it is. Your cha- how, do you, how does someone argue with your changed life? How do you do that? How do you argue with someone who has joy all the time and we're going through what we're going through in our world? Not that you're perfect. You're going to have your days. But how, how is it? How, would they, how is someone going to argue what Jesus has done in your life? You can't take that away. And they couldn't take away this guy's story. He was standing right in front of them. So this is what they say, verse 16. What should we do with these men? They asked each other. We can't deny what they have performed a miraculous sign and everybody in Jerusalem knows about it. Can't deny it. But to keep them from spreading their propaganda any further, we must warn them not to speak to anyone in Jesus' name again. See, they were threatened because they saw Jesus was working. So they called the apostles back in and commanded them never again to speak or teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, do you think God wants us to obey you rather than him? We cannot stop telling about everything we have seen and heard. Church, your life is a testimony. You can't stop but tell everyone what you've seen and heard. When you're together in the body of Christ and you're reaching and you're going, God is going to show you miracles. He's going to do miracles through you. He's going to do healings. You're going you're to reach people and they're going to get saved. And you're going to have so much evidence, a cloud of witnesses around you. No one can deny it and you have to keep sharing it. But again, we must be with Jesus. We must let Jesus change us from the inside out. And we're going to pray here in a minute. So I'm going to ask the worship team to come up because there's a powerful prayer that the church does here soon. And together we want to hang out with God and pray in closing here. Because we're going to face opposition. We already are. We already are right here in America. I want to encourage you with something. You plus God equals the majority. Don't look for the crowds. Don't even look at the crowds. There won't be a crowd around the Christians. They'll be the church. There won't be a huge crowd. Narrow is the gate to Jesus Christ. Many will perish. Many are going to perish without Jesus. Don't look for the crowds. We don't need the crowds to make us feel like we're right or we're confident. You just need God. Amen. Being a Christian in this world is unpopular, so be comfortable with being unpopular. Young people, the pressure to conform to the ways of this world are ridiculous. Don't fall for it. Adults, maybe we already have conformed and we need to repent and be shaped by the gospel and the word of Jesus Christ. Parents, we must teach our kids in the way they should go so they won't depart from it. Me and God equals the majority. That's all I need. But the bonus is we have each other. And we need to be here for each other. And that's why we come together on Sundays. That's why we come together in groups or get together with a few and have coffee. Church, I can't can't emphasize this enough. We must do that. If you think it's bad now, wait until it gets worse. You'll need the encouragement. You'll need the strength 
of others around you to pray for you because you're going to share the gospel. You're going to lay hands on the sick and they'll be healed and there'll be people that will shun you for it and hate you for it and unfriend you for it. Don't worry because Facebook friendship is not really friendship. Now, I always like to preface with this. Doesn't mean we're a jerk about being followers of Christ, right? We do it with grace and love and truth. This is what they said in verse 23. The council then threatened them further, but they finally let them go because they didn't know how to punish them without starting a riot. For everyone was praising God for this miraculous sign, the healing of a man who had been lame for more than 40 years. Do you see that? The opposition now has to retreat because of the power of Jesus Christ. Our opposition will retreat. They will retreat. They will hold back. What's going to happen is not the whole, not all those who persecute us will do that. They'll still be that. But what's going to happen is people are going to see miracles and signs and wonders happen right in front of them and they're going to stop fighting us and come to our side. They're going to believe in Jesus Christ. You know it, don't you? You know what I'm talking about. They won't be able to deny what takes place. By the way, we find out in Acts that many of these people end up giving their life to Christ. Many priests, the Bible says, came to Christ. You got to read the whole book. But here's what they did. They go home and they go back to the church, most likely a house, maybe the temple. And this is what it says in verse 23 of chapter 4. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers and told them what the leading priests and elders had said. When they heard the report, all the believers lifted their voices together in prayer to God. So we should pray together, shouldn't we? Can we stand together? Because we're going to practice it. And we need room in our services to pray. Amen. And on Tuesday nights when we pray, it's important. On Tuesday mornings, the staff will be praying even more this month and ongoing as a team. But on Tuesday nights, we pray together online. We believe the Spirit will move through our online prayer. This is what it says. They prayed this, O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor David, your servant saying, why were the nations so angry? Why did they waste their time with futile plans? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord and against his Messiah. But what we find out is they don't succeed. That's Psalm chapter two. They go on to say this. In fact, this has happened here in this very city for Herod Antipas, Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all against Jesus, your holy servant whom you anointed but everything they did was determined beforehand according to your will. And now, O oh Lord, ready for this? this? I love this prayer. This is going to make you reevaluate your prayer life. It's going to make you think about your faith and what we're praying. It says this. And now, O oh Lord, hear their threats <laughs> and give us your servants great boldness in preaching your word. There's no retreat. In fact, they ask for more power, more boldness to preach the word. And by the way, Jesus sent out the disciples in light of they would be persecuted and face opposition. He didn't go, hey, just give you a heads up. You're going to face opposition. So you know what? Maybe we'll just, we won't send you out yet. We'll wait till it gets all better. No. And so they pray like that. They pray. They don't say, God, take us away from this opposition, they say, help us through it. And he goes on to say this, stretch out your hand with healing power. Guess who, guess who the hands and feet are of Jesus? We are. Because Peter and John went and prayed and they delivered the healing through the power of the Holy Spirit. God healed through them. Church, you are the hand of deliverance, of healing, 
for God. God has called us to be that hand and he'll fill you so you can do it. But you can't do it alone. You need the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna keep reading. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. I don't see a retreat. I see an advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen, amen, amen. Let's pray together. Let's pray together. Yes. God, let's lift our hands together. I know this might be awkward for some, but we're just asking God. We want to receive from God today. God, we come to you. You are sovereign. You are greater than any other God. God, we as the church need you, Lord. Lord, we thank you, God. Give us boldness, Lord. Give us courage and strength through your Holy Spirit. Lord, for those who will obey your word and go and preach the gospel and pray and love the lost, God, anoint them with your Holy Spirit. Baptize them in the Holy Spirit. Overwhelm them and clothe them and pour out your spirit upon them, God. So when they stretch out a hand, there will be healing in Jesus' name. It will be all for your, for your name, God, in your glory and not ours. Jesus, we pray that you would disrupt the enemy right now. You bring confusion in his camp in our world right now. In Jesus' name. God, we pray that we would not be weak believers, but we would be bold and strong in you, Lord. That, God, we would not be coming at each other as believers and devouring one another, as your word says, but we, we would be united together in love and peace and unity as the church body, that we would support one another, God. I, God, I pray that we would come together and pray, that we would come together and worship you, Lord, that we would come together in faith, God, that your spirit would pour out of other believers into this room and to when we get together, whether it's for coffee or in our homes, God, your spirit would rise up out of us, Lord. God, give us faith to see that we're not ordinary, but we're extraordinary in your hands. And God, may we be the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. God, I pray that when the world sees your works, they won't be able to deny the fact and the truth that you are good, you are real, and you are healing souls and lives in Jesus' name. We praise you, God. We thank you, Lord. We will not be afraid. We are not alone. You walk with us. No matter how many people come against believers, you walk with us, God. And because of that, we walk in confidence and we go into the dark places of this world and we proclaim the name of Jesus Christ and we light the night and we light the day and we light those dark places, God, so they will know true salvation, so they'll be ready for your return. Lord, light up your church, God, with your Holy Spirit, God. May we have a hunger for more of you. Lord, as we get together, may it be a fire, coals burning, Lord, for us to reach the lost. God, give us favor and success every time we speak your name, Lord Jesus. I pray for our neighbors, my neighbors, Lord, that they would see the truth of Jesus Christ, that you would rip off the veil and, and all the scales over their eyes, that they would see the gospel of Jesus Christ. God, I pray you would silence our enemy, Lord Jesus. Lord, return the threats back to them, God, and confuse them, and may they see the love of the church for them, God. God, I pray there wouldn't be any confusion about our message. We preach boldly because we care and love for our neighbors. We care and love about their salvation. We don't want them to be damned to hell. We want them to receive everlasting life. Lord, may they see this Lord Jesus in the church, God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, God. God, they may look at us as crazy, but we're crazy in love with you, Lord Jesus, because of what you've done for us, Lord God. We thank you, Lord. God, we believe who you are. This is who you are, God. You're a miracle worker, a way maker, God. In spite of our ordinary life, you make us extraordinary, God, and you will do amazing things, Lord. Thank you, God. Church, let's sing this together. Let's declare that God is the way maker in this world. In Jesus' name, let's worship and pray. Yes, sir.